Hey, thanks for tuning in to Fishing 411. My name is Mark Romanak, and on this week's episode, we're going out of Algoma country, beautiful White River Air, flying this to a wilderness adventure for pike and walleye. Stick around. Offshore Tackle presents Fishing 411 with Mark Romanak. Gobble. Gobble up there. <laughs> Look at that, he's in the bag. Fishing 411 is brought to you by Offshore Tackle, the leader in trolling technology. Okuma, high performance. Vicious Fishing. Northwest Ontario Tourism, there's no place like this. Jay's Sporting Goods. Get in gear. And by Yakima, home of the rooster tail. I think I was probably about 18 or 19 years old when I took my first fly-in fishing adventure to Ontario, and I've been doing them every year since. They really are unique. Uh, you just can't beat that wilderness experience of climbing onto an airplane. Uh, these are de Havilands uh, that they're using, either beavers or otters or the primary you know, float planes that you see in this part of the world. And just the sound of those engines firing up, man, it just, it spells adventure and it spells fishing fun. The thing to keep in mind on a flying trip is that you're limited to how much weight you can haul in on these trips. Generally speaking, it's 75 to 100 pounds per person. So you really gotta pack kind of carefully, to make sure you have everything you need for your trip, but not too much weight, go over your weight limit. Well, it's the first day of our White River Air fly-in fishing adventure, and this is a pike and a walleye trip, and the 98 cent question becomes, where do you start? There's a lot of water here, and uh, some of the things that I would recommend, on this particular trip, I brought in a, a small portable sonar unit. It's Elite 7 by Lowrance, and I've got it mounted uh, remote or portable here. I've got GPS for navigation, of course, sonar, but even more important than that, in some instances, this particular graph tells me water temperature. So I'm looking at 69 to 70 degrees on the surface right now. And that gives me a good cue as to what might be happening. It's the end of June, the water temperature is 70. That means the fish are going to be active. And it also means that the weed growth is going to be established. And there's a pretty good chance if I can find weeds, I'm going to find fish using the weeds, both pike and walleye. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look around me and I'm going to try and see if I can have some obvious visual cues of where to start. Things like points are always good places to start. Weed beds that you can see growing up above the water and also submerged weed beds that you can see both on the sonar and just by looking into the water are going to be good places to start. So those are going to be my first places because the water temperature is warm and I think the fish are active. I probably can get by with a fast presentation, something that I'm moving quick through the water. 
uh, a spinner bait, a crank bait, um, a jig that I'm actually swimming through the water, not just hopping on bottom. So I want to cover water first pretty quickly until I come to the conclusion of what maybe is going on out here. If the fish will bite on this fast presentation, that's a good thing. If not, I may have to slow down. But I think with water temperature the way it is today, we can get fish to bite moving baits pretty fast. Let's get started. There's a fish. I think I found me a little pocket of walleyes here. All I'm doing is pitching a little quarter ounce jig with a grub tail on it. And the reason why I've opted to pitch is because I can cover ground a little bit faster. That's the carbon copy of the one that I just lost. That's a little nicer, eh, maybe a little bit nicer fish. Certainly the kind I'm looking for for lunch. Let's see if I can give him the old alley-oop here. That's gonna be my dinner tonight right there. That's what we're looking for. That size right there is perfect for the table and that's exactly where he's gonna go. I'm just throw him up there, out of my way and we'll see if we can maybe find some more. One of the mistakes I think that people make in walleye fishing is they don't think shallow often enough. That fish I just caught in about three to four feet of water, believe it or not. Clear water, the old adage that walleyes are light sensitive and that they don't like to be in shallow water, none of that could be further from the truth. Actually, they're very aggressive feeders and they'll move in as shallow as they have to move to find forage. And in this lake, it looks like there's a lot of perch in this lake. We're seeing lots of little schools of perch and stuff. And the perch are in shallow right now spawning. Guess what? The walleyes will come in shallow and do the same thing. Additional considerations provided by Evan Root Outboards and Starcraft Marine. Additional considerations provided by Ontario's Algoma Country. One of the things I do when I'm fishing with light braid, I very rarely ever tie my lure directly to the braided line. I prefer a clear fluorocarbon style leader. Um, the way I'm walleye jigging here is I'm spooling up with Vicious Braid 10 pound test, and then I'm tying on a short leader of 10 pound test fluorocarbon. And the reason I prefer that, there's a couple of reasons. One, you got that invisible leader down to your lure so the fish can't see the line. Secondly, when you do break off your jig and have to retie, it's a lot easier to retie fluorocarbon than it is to retie, retie braid. The problem with braid is you have to have very sharp scissors to cut it. Um, it tends to fray a little bit. It's hard to get through the eye of the jig. And so for me, it's just faster and more convenient to tie my jigs on directly using a fluorocarbon leader. Now, let me show you exactly how we do it. It's a knot called the double uni. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna lay the two lines over top of one another so they overlap about a foot, foot and a half. I'll start here with the braid and what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap it into a little loop and pinch it in my fingers. And essentially all I'm going to do is I'm just going to run this braid around through the loop I just made. One, two, three, four, five, about six times. Once I get it through six times I'm going to pull the tag end of my braid what that's going to do is it's going to create a loop. It's going to tighten up that loop and it's going to make a knot on the leader. But I'm not going to pull it up tight. I'm just going to leave it kind of loose there. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the whole shooting match and I'm going to spin it around the other way. Okay. And this time what I'm going to do, instead of looping the braid, I'm going to loop the fluorocarbon just like I did before. And I'm going to do exactly the same thing again well, this time the fluorocarbon is going to go around the braid. Same number of loops. If you've got a lucky number, use it. Usually I do six. Okay, same thing. I'm going to pull that loop up until it forms a little knot. Now what I've got is I've got two knots on the line. And if I go back and I grab the main line and I grab the leader, what I can do is when I start to pull them, they come together. And when they come all the way together, the two knots bind together in the middle and that's what forms the bind that I'm looking for. And I'll end up with two tag ends here. I'll end up with a little tag end of braid right there, and I'll end up with a little tag end of fluorocarbon right there. And what I can do is I can cut them off real short, and then what I end up having is my main line. There's my braid to the main line going back to the fishing rod. Now I have this fluorocarbon leader, and in this case, it's a little longer than I need it, but that's okay because this knot up here is so small, it'll reel right into the tip top, so I can reel it right in when I'm casting. 
Now, as I'm fishing, what will happen is the line will get abraded down here by the jig. Eventually, I'll have to retie the jig, or in cases if oh, you get another pike might bite off your jig, um, you're going to be retying and retying quite a bit. So by the end of the day, this nice long three foot leader ends up just being a short six or eight inch leader, and then that's when I usually retie them. Once a day will usually get me through a whole day of fishing. So that's the double uni for attaching fluorocarbon leader to small diameter braid. There we go. Look at that. Jig popped right out. Let me get him out of here. Show him off a little bit. Yeah, perfect eating size again. I love these Canadian lakes. You know, they're just literally alive with walleyes this size and larger. A lot of fun for jig fishing. <laughs> this week's episode was set in a place called Shecak Lake, and it's one of the many fly out fishing camps maintained by White River Air. White River Air is one of the largest operations in this part of the country for fly outs. They maintain a wide variety of camps, and they basically have something for everything. Uh, and every fishing budget. It's a, a very unique operation. It's been in business since 1959. Very trustworthy, very honest people. You can really get your money's worth when you fish with White, White River Air. Folks would not believe where I'm catching these walleyes. Most people understand what pencil reeds are or bulrush. And that's what I'm fishing. These fish are actually right in the pencil reeds. Maybe in about three feet of water, four foot max. No one would ever dream that you can catch walleyes in the middle of the day in water that shallow. But I'm telling you, they're right here, and there's living proof of it. <laughs> Get this one up here really quick. Another good pan sized walleye in <laughs> three feet of water pitching jigs. <laughs> I love it. Fishing 411 is brought to you in part by Precision Trolling Data, the Troller's Bible, now available in an app. Mark Romanex Fishing 411 is brought to you in part by O.J. Herman Company. Let's talk a little bit about jig fishing gear. If you're going to come up here and do a fly-in fishing trip and you're primarily going to target walleyes, which a lot of people do, you want to come up here equipped with the right gear to be successful. I'd recommend a spinning rod like what I have in my hand here. A six and a half to a seven foot uh, rod is about right. Of course, you're gonna get a nice graphite rod. Um, and I would recommend no heavier than a medium action and preferably uh, for jig fishing, a medium light action. And that's what I'm throwing here. I'm throwing a seven foot C3, it's an Okuma rod, and it's a medium light action. And it's just perfect for throwing jigs from an eighth to a quarter. You can actually even bump up to a three eighths ounce jig if you needed to for a little deeper water. But this is a good setup. Of course, the spinning reel that I have on here is a 25 or a 30 series reel is what I would recommend for size. And I've got braided line on here. 10 pound test uh, is what I prefer. This happens to be vicious braid and you notice that it's bright yellow in color. The reason I have it bright yellow in color is because it's easier to see and a lot of times when the fish will, will bite this jig, I'll actually see the line dart sideways and it allows me just a little edge in determining some bites that I might not always feel. When the fish bites on slack line, you don't necessarily feel the bite, but you will see the line move or twitch. And if you pay attention to the way the line enters the water, uh, that yellow line will definitely help you catch a few more fish. Even on a gray overcast day like today, I can see it. Nice fish. That's a beautiful walleye. Well, he goes back. Oh, you know what? He was going back anyway. That's exactly where he needed to go. Let's talk a little bit about jig head styles for pitching. When I'm throwing a jig like this, I like to have a jig style that has a long shank on it, first of all. Long shank hooks, I think, they have a little bit better hookup ratio uh, than short shank jigs. I'm also looking for a jig style that has the eye coming out the front of it so it pulls through the grass and weeds. And that's again, we're throwing in the pencil reeds here. So I want something that's gonna avoid some of the weeds. Now you can see I can't avoid them all the time. There I got some right on the hook that time. But let me show you what I'm talking about. Let me get this grass off here. The style of jig really does help. If I was throwing a regular ball head jig right now, what would happen is the line would be coming straight out the top and I would be catching a lot of grass on the front of it. This particular jig here, is actually a long shank slow poke, and the eye comes out near the front. 
It's designed for swimming, so it swims along and it doesn't pick up much grass. It's amazing how well I can swim that through the grass and not pick up grass on every single cast. Like I was saying, the jig itself makes a difference in when you're pitching like this. And a long shank jig, like the slow pot long shank, is just perfect for putting big grub bodies on. Now, if I was gonna run live bait today, say I was gonna use a minnow or a piece of crawler um, as bait or even a leech as bait, you wouldn't really necessarily need this long shank jig. In that case, what I'd recommend is the other slow poke, the original slow poke, it has a shorter shank on it, and it's ideally suited for pitching with live bait. Because I'm using plastic today, I need that extra hook gap and that extra hook length in order to accommodate these soft plastic bodies. We've talked a little bit about the lead head jigs that we're using. We've also talked about the rods and reels, that type of stuff. Um, what we haven't talked about in much detail are the grub bodies that we're using. And there's lots of different styles of grub bodies suitable for what we're doing today. Uh, the classic curl tail grub, or what a lot of people just call twister tails, would work very well for what we're doing today. That's a good option. I am happen to be throwing what I call a shad body, um, but it's one that I like a lot. The other one that's really popular out there is what they call minnow grubs, or split tail grubs. They're very popular as well. Any of those would work today. However, I think that when you're swimming a jig like this and you're moving it in a horizontal plane, missed that one, when you're moving the jig towards you in a horizontal plane, you want a tail that has maximum action. So I think that the shad body that I picked today, or maybe a twister tail, would be my best option. The middle style grubs that just have the little split tail on them, they work really good, but I prefer to use them in deeper water when I'm jigging almost straight down right at a 45 degree angle where I'm just hopping the jig on the bottom and I'm, letting, I'm creating my own action, so to speak. Because this is moving through the water, that twiggling tail back there, that tail that's wobbling in the water, is what really is getting the job done for me. So it really is important to use a grub that has lots of action. And uh, I can't say enough about these shad tail grubs. They are just dynamite for walleyes, pike, smallmouth, you name it, just about any species of fish, they work really well for. And away he goes. That's a lot of fun. Additional considerations provided by Lorance Electronics. Find, navigate, dominate. Additional considerations provided by Mustang Survival. We save lives for a living and bait rigs tackle. There's another one. Man, this is a lot of fun. Pitching jigs into shallow water, feeling that thunk. When the fish grabs it, man, that is a lot of fun. This is a heavy fish. I got a, got a feeling this is not going to be a walleye. Considering that most of the walleyes I've caught have been about two pounds here, I got a feeling this might not be a walleye, but a pike. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They're here too, and they're fun to catch as well. Whoa, come on. I'm a little bit undergunned right now for a pike like this. In any place you're going to find walleyes, you're going to find pike mixed in with them, generally speaking. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Look, he bit the tail right off of my, my grub there. I have to replace that. Since we got walleye on the diet today, I think we'll go ahead and let that pikey go. All right, let me dig in here and grab out another one of these grub bodies. Since that pike bit off my grub body and I got to replace it, now's a good time to explain how I thread a grub body on. It's really quite simple. And you'll see in a second here why this long shank is important. What I'm gonna do is take the hook point, go right in the nose of the grub, and I'm gonna go as straight as I can in about half to three quarters of an inch, and I wanna come straight out the back. And you're gonna understand here in a second why. What I really wanna do is I wanna push the grub up onto the shank so that the collar holds the grub in place. And there it goes, just like that. And by making sure that the hook point comes out the middle of the back, the grub runs in there nice and straight and it'll pull straight through the water. And that's what I'm looking for. Let's give that a try. You know, we've been having a lot of fun catching walleyes in very shallow water, just two to three feet of water. And the 98 cent question becomes, why are these fish so, you know, so shallow in the first place? And really the answer is as simple as forage. Um, what's going on here, in my opinion, we're fishing the edges of pencil reeds. Another species of fish that's common in these lakes spawns in pencil reeds about this time of year. It's late June, and this is the time of year you're most likely gonna find yellow perch in shallow spawning. Yellow perch spawn in weeds and their eggs stick right to the, to the weeds under the water. So now what's going on is you got these, these yellow perch coming in here, 
and they're spawning in the weeds, and of course, the walleyes come right in to try to feed on them as well. Oh my goodness. There's evidence on the line here of where we're fishing. Weeds. I'm gonna probably regret this, but I'm gonna alley-oop this one. Whoa, that's a pretty good fish. That's a pretty good fish. We'll sit down here. In June, when you do one of these fly-in trips, you need to expect the fish to be shallow. And I mean two, three feet sometimes. You're looking for weeds, things like bulrushes, pencil reeds, what some people call bulrushes. The other weed that I look for quite a bit is I like to find something called pond weed or cabbage weed. If you find those types of weeds, chances are you're gonna find walleyes just like this one. You know, another one of the issues you might deal with when you come up in a, on a fly-in trip like this is we've been pretty fortunate. Most of the fish we're catching are walleyes because that's what we're targeting. But we did catch some pike. One of the things that you'll notice is when you're fishing in areas where they're mixed, you get a lot of bite offs. You're going to donate a lot of your a lot of your jigs. The pike will simply grab the line, and uh, their sharp teeth will bite bite right through the line. One of the ways that you can kind of reduce that, you can't completely eliminate it, but what you can do is instead of going with a lighter fluorocarbon leader, I've just got a 10 pound test fluorocarbon leader, you could bump up that leader a little bit. You could go to 15 or even 17 pound test. It's not going to keep you from catching walleyes, yet it will prevent some of those pike from biting through that leader. So that's a good option if you get in a situation where you're just catching too many pike and losing too many jigs. There we go. <laughs> no grub on that one. All right, I'll give you my grub. Away he goes. One grub, one fish. I'm not batting too good an average on my grubs. Luckily, I got a bunch of them. There's fish. That felt like a walleye. It is indeed. Oh, 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 oh. Nice fish. Man, we're having a picnic here. We're just absolutely having a picnic. Oof. That one might be a little bigger than I want to eat right there, and I think it is indeed. Let me sit down here and show it off. Not big walleyes by any stretch of the imagination, but they're awful nice ones. Most anybody would be really tickled to catch a fish like that. Hey, my name is Mark Romanak, and you've been watching Fishing 411. I hope you picked up a thing or two today about pitching grubs in the shallow water for walleye. It's an amazing technique that will put a lot of eaters like this on your shore lunch. Closed captioning is provided by Cisco Fishing Systems. Innovation makes us number one. Quality keeps us there. Fishing 411 has been brought to you by Offshore Tackle, Okuma, Vicious Fishing, Northwest Ontario Tourism, Yakima Bait, and Jay's Sporting Goods. Ooh, this one's a toothy gator this time instead of a wally. Like I said, they're all mixed in together. And a jig bite on a, on a pike like this or a walleye is virtually identical. The sensation is exactly the same. There he goes. 